Good morning, Mission. How are you? Good. I got to tell you, I'm so excited to be here today. I also want to give just a special shout out to, to our folks in Oxnard. Most Sundays, that is where my family and I get to worship. I love what God is doing there. And just personally, I'm so excited to be here this morning because this, this church, long before my wife and I moved here to be a part of this church family, I, I've loved this church. So I, I got to meet so many of the folks who started this church in the early years before you'd ever gathered. And so I've got to see it come alive. I, I've got to see you guys grow up. And now that I get to say, man, I'm part of the family, man, it's just, it, it just feels great. And so it's fun. Thank Yeah. I, I, back in the day, I would drink out of my mission mug, even when I was in, living in Utah, and I would pray for you all. If it was snowing outside, I would curse for you all a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> Today, guys, we are in this series called Late Night, and uh, we're looking at these moments where Jesus meets people at night. And I think it's kind of brilliant because if, if you meet me in the morning, I, I'm probably not going to want to talk to you much, right? Like I got my coffee, I want to get my coffee, I got to get out the door. If you meet me during the day, I got my things to do, I want to check off that to-do list. If you go home, you have some dinner, maybe you put the kids down, hang out with your spouse or your friends. And all of a sudden, the conversation becomes real, becomes raw, like the filters are gone away. And what we've looked at these last couple of weeks, what we'll look at today and even in the series moving forward, are these moments where Jesus meets us. When we're kind of raw and unfiltered, when we've, we, we've let down the guard. We're, we're willing to ask him honest questions. We're willing to get pointed with him. And he's willing to hear us, receive us, and respond back to us. And it's my hope that we're in this posture today. We're in this position where he comes and he teaches us about who we are and who he is. And we say, yeah, let me take it all in. And I hope you know he, he is okay with us asking questions. He is okay with us pushing back. But I pray that we would just let down the guard and also hear what he has to say to us. We're going to be in John chapter 3, and it's the story of Nicodemus. I'm just going to read the first few verses, then I'll explain it a little bit, and we'll start to talk about kind of the, the when, the what, the, the who, the how of this story. It says, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. We'll talk about that in just a second. It says, this man came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, Unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So it's kind of wild as it says, like Nicodemus is this, this teacher of the, of the law. He's this Pharisee, a ruler of the people of Israel. And what was happening at this time is Jesus was teaching and preaching and things were happening. People were following him. Miracles were happening all over. And so the religious people of the day, the people who Nicodemus hung out with, they looked at Jesus and they didn't say, yay. They said, we got to get rid of this dude. We got to make sure he's silenced. But there was something about him. Nicodemus couldn't get over it. He couldn't join that crew who said, I want to be done with him. He was like, I got to talk to him. Like, I can't just dismiss these miracles. I can't just be done with this teaching. I got to find out who he is. But he knows that his reputation's at stake. He doesn't want others to see him. And so what does it say? It says he goes there at night. And he goes to talk to Jesus, to ask him some questions. He starts out and he says things like, Jesus, man, you must be from God. Like we're seeing the things that you're doing. You must be from God. It's a way to kind of pump him up, isn't it? Like if somebody said that to me, you must be from God, I'd be like, oh, shucks, right? I guess, yeah, I guess, <laughs> right? But what does Jesus say? Jesus responds with a pretty odd statement, pretty bizarre. He says, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is Boom. He's saying, you, you, you think that your job, your role in our world is to tell people about God's kingdom, to tell people about who God is? 
unless you are born again, he uses these words, you don't know anything about God's kingdom. You can't see God's kingdom unless you are born again. What do you think of when you hear that phrase, born again? What comes to your mind? What comes to your heart? Some of you, it might be yes, like that is the, uh, 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 it just warms your soul. Some of you, you might be like, I, I don't know, I have some questions or I'm, I'm confused about what that means. Some of you might be like, I've never been in church, Kyle. I've never heard that term. It's all okay. Nicodemus didn't know what it meant. He says to Jesus, born again. What are you talking about, man? He goes, I'm a grown man. Can I go back into my mom's womb? That's what he says to him. He's like, I don't understand this. He's like, it doesn't make any sense to me. And Jesus takes the rest of the conversation to tell to him, to explain to him, to show him what it means to be born again. Again, what do you think about when you hear that? I wanna flash you back to the mid 90s, okay? I know some of you were never, you, you were not born yet, and that's okay. We're gonna get you there. My son, my, my oldest son, he calls it the 1900s. <laughs> He'll say, Dad, we were talking about baseball the other day. He's like, Dad, you played baseball in the 1900s. <laughs> At first I was like, no, I, I'm like, oh yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Whew. In 1997, I met the first person in my life who would have said that they were born again. I grew up in Mormon, Utah. All I knew was that faith. I hadn't met a Christian or any, anyone that told me they were. And then I met this girl who I really liked and I, I started to get to know her and she told me that she was a Christian. I said, what does that mean? She said, well, it means I've been born again in Jesus. Guys, I just had this really limited category, this really narrow idea because growing up in Utah, I didn't have a clue what that meant. All I had seen were some things on TV and some things in movies. So when she said that, I didn't know what to think. So I just want to get you in the mindset of the 90s. And so what I want to do is just show you a picture of what maybe I looked like then. There we go. Look at that. Look at that. Really, to be honest, I always use any excuse I can to show me a picture with hair. Okay? <laughs> just being real. But I got the Massimo shirt. I guarantee it was an XL, maybe even an XXL, because that's just what you did. My pants, the Levi silver tabs, they were probably more cloth was used in those jeans than probably three pairs of my jeans now, right? The 90s, I'd grown up in Mormon, Utah, and I meet this girl. She says she's born again, and I just had these questions running through my head. These questions about what does that mean? And we've been doing this late night series and every, every weekend we kind of give a, a, a shout out to one of the late night shows. And since we're talking about the 90s, I have to give one to David Letterman, okay? Because he, he always had what? His top 10 list, right? Right. So I'm not David Letterman, so I could only come up with the top three. But the top three questions that were running through my head when this girl who I really liked, who by the way now is my wife, but who I really liked, told me she was born again. Number three was... Will she be as anti-dancing as the angry born-again pastor in the movie Footloose? Okay? <laughs> right? Right. Now, if you have never seen Footloose, guys, there is a pastor in that movie who hates dancing so much that he gets the town to outlaw it. But they didn't know Kevin Bacon was coming. Like Kevin Bacon is like the Luke Skywalker of dance and he shows up on the scene and he takes out everyone and they dance again, right? I was like, man, it's the mid nineties. That is the golden era of hip hop. I need to know if my girl, like if she wants to, if she can dance, she could. She wasn't, she wasn't quite like John Lithgow in the movie. Okay, that's number three. Number two, does she have her own 1-800 number that she can give out at any time and ask people for money? See, I knew it, right? And some of you are gonna be like, huh, what? So you only get this, like if you're a kid in Utah growing up, you don't know born again people, you don't know Christians that much, but you do watch television. And so what I would do, and I just need to tell for the people who are under like 30, when TV shows used to be on at a certain time, you had to watch them at that time, okay? 
you had to go to your cable box and push the button to that to, if you had cable. And I liked to watch Inspector Gadget when I was a kid. Well, for some reason, the genius who, who programmed for this channel, before Inspector Gadget was a televangelist. And so I would get there five minutes before Inspector Gadget started because I wasn't going to miss the beginning. And I would watch the last five minutes of this guy's message every week. And every week he cried at the end and he said, you must be born again. And for some reason he would flash a number and he'd say, give me money all the time. And I was like, I don't know. I guess that somehow those connect. I don't know. Somehow they do. So she doesn't have a number, by the way. Uh, all right. We've done number three, number two. Now, number one, is it a requirement for born again women as they get older to wear as much eye makeup as Tammy Faye? Right? <laughs> Right? And look, let me be real. If you like, if you, if, you are, if you are down with the eye makeup game, I got nothing against that at all. I just needed to know I really liked this girl, what my future was going to be like. Like that stuff's expensive. That's like an extra couple years before you retire. I just needed to know. What do you think of when you hear born again? As Christians, we do surveys, and guys, people who aren't Christians often have negative ideas when they hear that term. Some people just have no concept of what it means. Even when you ask it in church, it's most often um, linked with how you vote than how you believe. But what you'll see in a moment is that Jesus, he doesn't play in any of those areas. He tells us exactly what it means and exactly how to step into this life that he's inviting every one of us into to be born again. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start kind of um, towards the end of the story when Jesus just lays it out and then we'll work back through it so we can know exactly how Jesus defines it and how beautiful it is that he would invite us into it. So further down, he says to Nicodemus, he says, the judgment is, this is the judgment the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. Jesus, when he says, this is the judgment, it's kind of understood as this is the verdict. This is reality. And what he says is that the light has come into the world. The scripture, that's Jesus. Jesus is called the light, the life, the one. He says before the light, like people, even with their best intentions, man, the roads they would go down were not roads about God. So often they were roads about themselves, how they could have power or safety or security, how it could be about them. But now the light has come into the world. The light being Jesus. And he brings truth. And he brings life. And he brings everything that we really actually need, that our souls actually hunger for, crave, desire. That's him. I had a mentor who would say, born again. He goes, he, I love to use the term born from above. Born in the light. See, when you're born again, things start to change. When Jesus becomes your God, when he becomes the one that you orient your life to, when it's not about what the world says or that voice inside your head or that voice from the past, it's not about the rules you think that we're supposed to abide by, but the light, Jesus. When he is who you orient your life around, things change. See, when you are born again, I want to just talk us through a few things you see differently. That was one of the first things I noticed about that girl who told me she was born again. She saw things differently. She saw herself differently and she saw others differently. No longer are people to be, um, are, are they kind of pawns in our world that we either gather on our side to support us or move out of the way because they're in front of us. They are image bearers of God that we gather in community with. And they look different than us and they talk different than us and they think differently than us, but we always know that we're centered around Jesus and man, God makes beautiful things out of that. That's what our church is. 
When we're born again, we see differently. For those of you who wake up every day and you're on that treadmill of just thinking you have to have this image, you have to have this certain output in order to be valuable. When you're born again, you see that your God sees you, that he pursues you, that he loves you. You see differently. When you're born again, you think differently. Have you ever sat with someone and they say, you know, you're around church for a while and they come to you and they say, hey man, I'm gonna do X, Y, or Z. Like I'm gonna do this crazy thing. And the world would think you are nuts. But when you start to compare it to Jesus and his story, it just makes complete sense. I've seen people give ridiculous amounts of money away in God's name. I've seen them pick up um, from, from a job and a place and an area where they had all of the uh, maybe influence you could ever want, all of the security you would ever want, and they would move to a people group that they've never heard, that they've never known, and just to love them, to serve them, to be with them. I've seen college students, it challenges me sometimes. When I was in college, it's all about how do I get in the right school and get the right major? I've seen college students go, you know, I'm just praying that God would send me to a place where I can go to school, but actually just where I can serve his church. I'm like, wow. So you see differently. You think differently. And maybe the one that we should be known by the most, you love differently. You love differently. Jesus Jesus focuses on that throughout his ministry here on earth. How do we love as people who follow him? He says even people who don't love God, man, they can love those people that they like. He goes, but the mark of someone who follows him, who's been born again, born from above, is when you love those who are your enemy or love those you've never even thought of before. Just this famous verse that even if you never stepped into church until today, you might have heard. It says, for God so loved the world, right? But I love the translation that we're going to study today because it says, for God loved the world in this way, which is actually the more accurate way to translate it. See, because the one makes me think that God just loves us, like he just thinks about us and he loves us. But this one says he loves us, but he has action behind it. He's coming after us with passion. He's not just sitting up there feeling something, but he's moving towards us. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God loves this way. We live in a world, right, where love is just thrown about, that word love. Like I can love my wife and I can love tacos. Tacos are good, but they shouldn't be the same word, right? And how would you, I'm not going to die for a taco. As much as I felt like that sometimes. But for my wife, no doubt. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do anything and everything I can to get to my boys if they're in danger, to let them know I love them, to help protect them, to be with them. And I love that God says, I love this way. I love that I I sacrifice for you. I humble myself for you. I pursue you. I come after you. Do you know what the Bible says? He doesn't do it on your best day, not on my best day. He doesn't do it when when you look the part. It says he does it when you're rebelling against him, when you're walking away from him, when you're ignoring him, when you're done with him. That's when he loves this way. That's when he comes after you. When you're born again, you love differently. You love like God. So when this starts to happen, we start to change. What happens in us? Take a look. You will begin to know Jesus rather than know about Jesus. It's very different. It's, It's just a little change in the way we talk about it, but it's very different in a lived reality. I could tell you all about my wife and my boys, but you'd have to know them to actually know them, right? You couldn't just walk up to them because I've told you some facts and say, oh yeah, I know you. Someone did that to you. That'd be the most offensive thing in the world. No, you spend time with them. 
when you see things differently and you think differently and you love differently, what you realize is Jesus is right there with you the whole time. And you know him rather than just know about him. Next one is this. You take Jesus seriously, but not yourself. I think that's kind of a hallmark of our church. Is man, we don't take ourselves too seriously. Yes, absolutely, every one of us, we were made in the image of God. But we also know we have our bad days, our flaws. Nobody, never is it about the person here. It's always about Jesus. Why is this so big? Because guys, um, when we step into our day-to-day lives, even when we have the best intentions, we'll fail. We'll come up short. But Jesus never asks us to always hit the mark. He asks us to always hold tight to him because he always hits the mark. And he's always there with us, alongside us, with grace, mercy, goodness, kindness, presence. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We take Jesus very seriously. The last one is this. You will start thinking of sharing Jesus with your one and serving the other. If you've been around here at all, you know that we... um, we pray for our ones. We, we believe a story that God, that Jesus tells about a God who would leave the 99 to go find the one. And we know that that's how he has created us as well and called us into. So that's that one person that he puts into every one of our lives that we get to share the story of Jesus with. We get to talk about him with. And sometimes we just do it by the way we live and sometimes we sit down and just spell it all out or sometimes we just tell a story about how he's worked in our life. But when we are born again, when we are born from above, man, we want to talk about it. And then folks, we will go serve the other. That person we don't think about. That, that, That person who maybe have wronged us in the past. That person who... Man, now we forgive. Now we move towards. We serve the other. Why? Because when we were the other, walking away from God, warring against him, he served us. So maybe you're thinking, okay, now who needs to do this again? Who needs to be born again? Look at this. Jesus says it. Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Guys, I've spent a lot of money on an education to learn the languages that this Bible is translated from. And unfortunately, when it says here, like basically everyone has to, the ancient language means everyone has to. Okay? I've tried. I'm sorry. Tried to find that loophole. Jesus is talking to a religious leader, someone who would have been seen as as someone who um, had mastered kind of religion and theology. And he says, everyone, everyone must be born again. So then we ask, how? How does it happen? Well, there's a two-part response to that. First, we have to know that there there had to be a work. If we warred against God, if we rejected him and pushed him away, that has to be paid for. That has to be dealt with. There's something there in the relationship that has to be um, removed. And Jesus is that gift. I read you John 3.16 earlier, but I just want to go back just above it, just a couple of verses where you can see this. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness... So the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus quotes this old story, this ancient story where Moses, when he was leading the Israelites in the wilderness, they all started to get sick. 
And they needed to be healed. And so Moses takes this bronze serpent and he sticks it on a pole and he raises it up. And God tells him to tell him, if they look on it, they will be healed. But if they don't, they will die. So John, the author of this book, brings that story back up. He says, just as the Israelites looked on the bronze serpent, the way that we are born again is we look at Jesus as he is raised up. And we respond. That's why we have a cross in here today. So we have a cross at all of our locations. You can look and see that cross. So you can remember that this is how God loves. This is how he heals. This is how he gives us birth from above. And in a moment, in all of our locations, we'll have a chance to respond to that. And how do we respond? First, we believe. We believe that the only way we know the truth, the only way we are born from above is because Jesus was willing to humble himself and hang on that cross. And then we receive it into our life. It's just a gift. I can't earn it. You can't, no matter what you do. We say, thank you, God. And then we surrender. When we say, God, I want to have those eyes to see your kingdom. I, I can't do it, but you can give those to me. I believe it, I receive it, and I want to give you my life. No longer do I want this weight on my shoulders. I can't bear it. I'll give it to you, Jesus. You were never meant to be your own savior. But Jesus, when he hung on that cross became a savior for all of us. He says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And we all have that chance now to do that, to believe, to receive, and to surrender. Will you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you for the gift that you give us in Jesus. God, thank you for the way that you pursue us even when we war against you, when we've walked away from you, when we're done with you, you still come after us. God, thank you for the new eyes that you give us, the new minds, the new hearts. God, as we leave here today, would we believe that you love so powerfully that you gave your son for us? Would we receive that and trust it? And every day, would we surrender to you, Lord, and live by the true life that you've given us in that birth from above? We thank you and praise you and say all this in Jesus' name. Amen.